Hello and welcome back to the Villa Villa podcast. I'm here as always with my good friend Dan Wiseman. Dan, boy, did we sound good in the last episode. <laughs> yes, yes, mate. It's uh, it's a welcome change. Hopefully, for all you guys listening as well, we've tried to up the production value on our end, so hopefully it's more enjoyable your end. And once again, thanks to Charlotte. Um, she's doing the God's work for us, mate. Absolutely, absolutely. But we are here today to give a little bit of a, an international break roundup as that thankfully comes to a close, but also to preview Aston Villa versus Wolverhampton Wanderers away from home. But before we get into that, Dan, we do have a message from today's video sponsor. Dan, have you ever wanted an app that collates all the scores and news from your favourite teams in the whole of Europe, Dan? Have you ever wanted that? Is, is a constant need of mine, mate, because there's always news. That's the thing, is that we, we we love this game. We love the industry of football because it's ever-changing, mate, and you need a place to keep up with it all. And we have that place exactly for we you sure guys. Do, it's one football. Guys, this app is genuinely, it's life-changing. It's great because I actually already, I, I use it. Um, so it's like it's great because it's where I pull the stats from for the podcast so it's like there's also there's all that new stuff as well but you you can track all of the players stats from like across Europe for all the different leagues for continental football as well uh, it's, it's it's a dream it's a dream and the best part mate is it's free it's free and guys it would help support the channel massively if you check that one football using the link in the description down below we promise you guys won't be disappointed so guys, if you haven't checked out one football, make sure you do so using the link in the description. It helps Dan and I out more than you could imagine. Now, Dan, first of all, mate, it's been a fairly successful 24 hours in regards to international villains, hasn't it, mate? John McGinn's in the goals, both Ollie and Tyrone in the goals, a full 90 minutes for Luca Dean against South Africa. I mean, it's looking, it's looking pretty good, isn't it, mate? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, honestly, man, I, I was going to log on to the account this morning and, and do a thread, uh, but it just seems to be so much. Seems much. to be so much. Um, shout out. I think the biggest shout out goes to Matty Cash, um, who's booked his flights to Qatar. Um, absolutely buzzing. The, the celebrations looked fantastic. He tweeted out this morning that Polish vodka is pretty strong. So by the sounds of it, <laughs> he had a well-deserved good night um, with Lewandowski and co. Um, yeah, shout out to you, Matty Coutinho as well. Got a start for the Selecao. Uh, didn't finish the game, unfortunately, but just great to see him involved as they beat Brazil 4-0. Uh, I believe uh, that Bertie was involved with Burkina Faso as well. Against I think Belgium, they played, yeah. Yeah, they played Belgium. Uh, again, he started, but he didn't see out the full 90. But yeah, with, with Ty and JJ and Chuck getting involved... Uh, great to see Cameron Archer make his debut for the Young Lions as well. Uh, you absolutely love to see it. Just so much positivity going around, and, and yeah, mate, I think this is why uh, this is why I have some sentimental feelings towards the international break because they throw up these storylines, and it, it's great to see so many um, Villa boys involved with with so many different teams. Pretty on every continent now. We just need some guys out in Asia to uh, to yeah. start balling out, and then we'll have Villa truly across the world. But yeah, from uh, from Burkina Faso out to uh, out to Brazil, we've got Villa Boys in action. So it's fantastic, mate. It is, but I am kind of glad it's coming to an end. And somehow, Dan, I have a feeling that the optimism that you, I know you're feeling right now, we may not be feeling that come Saturday afternoon, mate, because this is by no means going to be an easy ride against Wolves at their place. Wolves, I mean... If we if we look back at the at, at the sort of capitulation that we had at home earlier on in the season, we completely dominated Wolves and they've been absolutely fantastic so far this season. Um, I think they are in a bit of a, a sort of a, a rough patch per se right now. That you know they they were kind of going that they were able to win a game, draw, you know, remain unbeaten, but they're kind of winning a game now, losing a game. Um, which is not ideal when you consider their sort of hunt for for European football that they that they see themselves on. Um, but you never you never quite know what you're going to get with this Wolf side because I believe they've only they've conceded like the fourth most uh, the fourth least amount of goals in the league. Sorry, so they they have a relatively solid defence. They're constantly outperforming their xG, um, which makes them really tricky to come up against Dan, doesn't it? Because if, if there's a side who is defensively resolute, 
and can statistically score more than they should be in a match, then you really have to bank on Villa being just as clinical, if not more clinical, than we know Wolves can be. Yeah, it is going to be a really tough game, mate. We always seem to be very match with Wolves. It's always very nip, nip and tuck. I think if you actually look at the head-to-head between very rare that you get a game between the two of us that ends with a team winning by more than one goal. You know, if you look at the last few results, it's all very close. It's 3-2, 0-0, 1-0, 1-0, 2-1, 2-1. Uh, the last time a team won by more than one goal in this fixture was our famous 4-1 victory over them at home back in 2018, which gave us a glorious goal from the Iceman himself, mate. We I, love him. Um, we miss him every day here on the Villa podcast. We really do. Uh, Berkir Bjarnason. Um, but yeah, so it, it's always a good game between two very evenly matched teams. Uh, I don't think it's ever really a game that either side goes into like a wash with confidence. I think especially for Wolves, it was all going very swimmingly for them uh, in the run-up to the uh, international break. They put four past Wolves and so then went and beat Everton at Goodison. Uh, but then there was that collapse at home to Leeds um, yeah. they, like the away side completed the most incredible comeback won that game 3-2 in the dying moments um, and, and for Villa it was it was sort of the opposite really we were in, in very good form and then we too you know went into the international break um, with a defeat with two defeats in fact obviously West Ham and Arsenal before that we, it was very much uh, Sunshine and Rainbows over at B6 mate so yeah it's it's going to be very interesting um, I, I'm looking forward to seeing exactly how we approach the game um, but we are sat you know there's only one place separating us in the table so whilst I think you know most Villa fans won't be looking forward to this game I, I would like to say that it's perhaps going to be more evenly matched than most would think I think it's going to be interesting to see how Villa set up. And I, I genuinely couldn't tell you whether Stevie's going to go with the more traditional 4-3-3 or the two tens. But when you come up against the back three, which we know Wolves like to religiously play, it's all about creating space. It's all about drawing the centre-halves out of position and, and having their midfield runners infiltrate the box. That's not something Villa that we've really necessarily seen since Steven Gerrard's come in. And I think... You know, I kind of I stuck my neck out on the last podcast, mate. When we uh, the, when we lasted a game, that is um, Arsenal. Um, I thought Villa looked a much more balanced team, having Bertrand Traore and Leon Bailey on the pitch, having two natural wingers, not necessarily hugging the touchline, but players that have pace and were able to beat a man and were looking to put crosses into the box. Um, that's not me saying I think that Leon Bailey or Bertrand Traore are better than Coutinho or Buendia obviously. Um, but I think there is something to be said about playing players in their natural positions. And it feels like this may be a game, if not for both, because I, I don't really see a world where Bertrand Triore fits into any Steven Gerrard system, which is a shame because he's a, he's a stunning player on his day. I really do see this as a game that Leon Bailey potentially starts, mate. Yeah, he, he's been... Um... It's really good to see him going out and performing for the reggae boys. He put in a man of the match performance uh, against El Salvador. Um, so yeah, more power to Leon. He was then, uh, he's also, I saw a lot of confusion um, about something he put on his uh, Instagram story. He's, he's now a brand ambassador for um, a company called Flow. Uh, and I saw a lot of confusions about this, but they're a sort of Jamaican communications and entertainment platform. Um, and so yeah, he's, like, he's been living his best life out in Jamaica. <laughs> um, obviously he had that, uh, those interactions with, with Raheem Sterling and, and the Royal family, Prince William and co and all that nice stuff they were doing out there for charity. So yeah, it's been a pretty nice return home for Leon. It's, it's a nice injection of confidence. I saw, you know, I put out a, a post on the, on the Heart of Hope account about his performance, sort of breaking it down into, into the key numbers. And I sort of got a few replies saying, oh, it's only El Salvador. It's only, it doesn't matter who it's against. We need this He's guy brimming it. with confidence playing his best football, doing it for his national team, building it fitness. I don't care who it's against. It's not relevant. It's like if he's putting in good performances, it's only going to be beneficial for Aston Villa Football Club. And so I think we are 
getting a better version of Leon Bailey. I think we're getting there. He's starting to show a few more flashes of, of what he's capable of. He's really been hampered by these injuries and, um, uh, you know, it'd be very easy to get beat down, but he seems like he's pretty determined on on getting back to his best um, and doing it for Villa and, and speaking of players that are getting back to their best, obviously playing a full 90 minutes means that there's every chance that Luca Dean can come back into the fold as well, who's someone I think we've missed at left back. So, um, yeah, I think I think those are two inclusions that it'd be very interesting to see them field at Molyneux. Sure. I think Dean's just so important to, to providing a much more balanced approach. And we know that Wolves generally look to attack down their right-hand side. You know, you look at the, the talent that they've got, the likes of Semedo, Trincao, um, we've seen Huang play on the wings on both sides. Um, you know, th- they've got a lot of pace. They've got a lot of tricky and skillful players. Um, and yeah, you know, ultimately it's again, we love Ashley Young, you know, to the end of the earth. But um, when your legs don't work like they have done before, not with that in danger of quoting Ed Sheeran here, um, <laughs> You know, ultimately, you need some pace there. Um, and that's really thrown me off there because all I could think of would think it out loud. Um, yeah, so ultimately having Dean back, hopefully he's in much better shape uh, than, than he was when he left the Villa. Obviously, I think it was a bit of a sort of, I want to say contentious decision. I think some people clearly weren't happy that Dean went away. Um, but, you know, there's there's all sorts of politics that are at play with international football and, there are genuinely about 70 right uh, left back, sorry, that can come and take Dean's spot at any given time. So showing up there, even if he's got two broken legs, it's absolutely the right thing to do, in my opinion. Keep yourself in Deschamps' good books. Um, now, Dan, this is a game, again, we're going to be talking about the midfield because it's it's the point of weakness for Aston Villa. You have to win this game in the midfield, right? With the midfield, pe- I'm sorry, I don't care how good they are. And we saw this against West Ham. And we're going to see this again. A midfield two should not be getting the better of a three or in in Villa's case in recent times, a diamond four. That should not happen. It should not be allowed whatsoever. Moutinho and Neves are fantastic players and it looks like Neves might actually miss this one, Dan, um, with injury or is it suspension? One of the two. This is a brilliant... uh, No, Jimenez is suspended, of course. Um, But I think we lost... Um, we lost Nevers in that Leeds game to injury um, and it's looking like a slim chance that he's actually going to come back um, so you have to absolutely take advantage of the fact that they don't have their star man in the middle of the park the person who makes things happen of course Moutinho is a fantastic player but I think having the, the legs of Neves really does complement him especially given his age um, and again mate Morgan Sanson let's start this guy let's see what he's got please I am dying to see it was nice to see um, Dean talk so uh, candidly about you know when he first joined the club and how helpful the likes of Morgan and Tyrone were Um, it's nice to just hear Morgan's name get mentioned really mate because it feels like it's just you and I that are ever ever uttering the name the word Morgan Sanson yeah it's it's um it's unfortunate because it's probably too come kind of a game too early for Nakamba, who we've yeah. seen is, is looking to get back on grass. Um, I think these, you know, we're coming into a few games where it'd be really nice to have him. It looks like he's going to get a run out against, uh, against Stoke with the under 23s. If unfortunately missed the Wolves game, but it does look like he might be back um, next time out for a, the game against Spurs, which then gives us real options in terms of if we do want to make any changes to that midfield. Um, Morgan Sanson, I mean, what do you even say at this point, mate? Uh, I saw him linked to a move um, to Nantes um, in France. Um, <laughs> just a side note on that club, everyone says Nantes. It's not. <laughs> it's- <laughs> Uh, just not the team um, and so yeah I saw him link with that move and um, yeah it, it wouldn't surprise you at this point mate would not surprise you I think there's it, you know it's it's. what do you think mate because a lot of 
when it was Dean, you could put it down to there seems to be an odd personal relationship there. Do you know what I mean? It was like everyone was down to like, ah, oh, something's not right between him and the gaffer. And like that seemed a bit believable. And I saw someone say, it's like, well, it's obviously not about ability. There's clearly something wrong on a personal level. That's why, because why else would he not be, especially when we've been struggling and it's seemed yeah. for so long that the midfield is, do you, do you buy into that? Like, what, what do you uh, think, mate? I don't know. I think it'd be easy for people to go, ah, oh, you know, he's just a, a lazy Frenchman, which is like, we can't really say that, can we? Um, but I don't know. I, the, the talent's clearly there. And I think the thing is, mate, we, like, the, the general public and, and, and football fans and everybody, we're so naive. We see the training picks. We see Morgan's, you know, saying all these things about hard work and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, we have no reason not to believe that. But it does kind of beg the question, if that's now two managers... And one of them is, you know, Stephen Gerrard, who quite clearly holds seriously high standards and, and drastically higher standards than Dean Smith ever held slash ever will hold. I think it may be fair to assume that maybe this is there is a, an issue with Morgan Sanson and how he trains. But, you know, someone, someone had clipped up a, a Sanson compilation video, which naturally I've watched about 100 times over the past week. And... He's just a wonderful footballer. And I appreciate, obviously, this is, it, it's all like he said, she said, whatever at this point, because nobody knows. And Stevie's even come out and said, like, look, he's a fantastic player. I'm really excited to, to work with him. But I, I don't know. It, it's, it almost Dude. seems like we're never going to see him play for Villa again, Dan. Yeah, it's it's one of them mate, where, you know, with every game that ticks, it, it seems more and more inevitable that he will be departing in the summer. Um, and then for me, he sits right atop the list of Villa what-ifs. Yeah. Um, because, you know, he's clearly such a fantastic player. Um, you look at what, you know, playing at a Champions League level uh, beforehand. Obviously, it's been over a year now that he's been at the club. Um, so he's had two managers to, to embed himself or at least make himself feel like an option. And, you mean, you know, obviously I understand that there has to be a pathway, but to see the likes of Tim and Carney sort of waltz from the under-23 straight into the first-team setup and look like they're going to be getting regular minutes. And then for, for Sanson, who's a first-team player and just hasn't been able to sort of get the, the similar sort of opportunities, it, it's really interesting. Um, but yeah, it's it's one of those where I think it's just a number of frustrations in the Villa midfield right now, mate, because John McGinn obviously scoring is brilliant, but how do we go about recapturing that that Scotland form and the way that he plays when um, he goes up there and represents the Tartan army? Because um, it's, it's brilliant to see what he does for his national team, and I absolutely love it. But at the same time, it's, it's never something that we're able to replicate. And obviously, I understand that he's got a very, very different role um, obviously he has to do a lot more covering when he's at the Villa. He spends a lot of the times sort of slotting in and protecting the fullbacks as they go forward. And he's in a far more attacking role. Um, but yeah, it just sort of highlights the fact that regardless, whatever the situation is, we don't get the best out of him. So yeah, I think the midfield is a, yet again, a real touching point. It'd be interesting to see how Stevie addresses it, given, you know, he's got a, a lot of things to consider. He's had the whole international break as well as looking at how his players have performed during it. Um, so he's, he's in a good position now to assess. And um, if I'm being completely honest with you, mate, I think it will be pretty much unchanged. That, I mean, that leads led, led me on to what my next question was, Dan, because again, you know, we kind of floated the idea about, again, somewhat controversially to some Villa fans, that maybe Jacob Ramsey needs a rest. And then he goes and channels his prime Stephen Gerrard for the under-21s. It's almost, it's almost like we can't win on this podcast, Dan. We're never going to see <laughs> We're never going to see Wesley. We're never going to see Keenan. It's it's just not going to happen, um, but yeah, I, I kind of have that feeling it's going to be unchanged as well, mate. And that's the thing, you know, it's good that we have so many players coming back and are you know fit and firing and ready to go. Um, but it, it does present a completely different issue. And I guess you know saying it's unchanged actually that's probably not going to be true, mate, because we probably won't see Danny Ings, <laughs> another player yes. who's here. We are yeah. more than happy to die on. Well, let, let me just flip it on its head, mate. Let me And so, like, you know, we were talking about giving JJ a rest, um, the likes of, of McGinn and, and these guys and everything like that. I think when you're in a position like 
realistically, we're sat in ninth. Wolves are the next team up in eighth, and there's 10 points between us and them, which even if we win, is a gap that we're unlikely to close. And if we do, the best that we do is finish eighth. So it's like with this position where realistically, I think the position that we're currently in might be the best we can hope for this season. Are you not just focusing, like better off focusing on individuals that you know will be here next season? Do you think that's a, that's a part of it? Because obviously whilst we'd love to see Sanson, I mean, even if he gets a start in all of the games until the end of the season, uh, you know, obviously he's clearly unsatisfied with how he is at the club and a move I think would still look likely. Uh, are you not just best sort of aligning yourself with the future, giving Tim the minutes, giving Carney the minutes, giving John and JJ, all these guys that you know will will stick around? Is is Do you think that's, that's part of it, maybe? What kind of a message does that send to, to Coutinho, though? Yes. What kind of a yeah. message does that send? Because, you know, we've just done a podcast. We're fairly confident in Villa's ability to get him. And obviously talks have opened. That's what the reports are saying. And it seems like it's just a matter of personal terms. Surely then personal terms will include, you know, winning as many matches and finishing as high up and, and competing at the highest level. And that is not me at all saying, yeah, let's go push for Europa. But I mean, if you look at the table, and again, I am not saying this is possible whatsoever, but we play Burnley twice. Um, we play Tottenham still. We play Liverpool, which is obviously a write-off. But um Amongst that, mate, we've got... Who else have we got? It'd be nice if my internet had loads. Uh, Leicester, we've got Norwich. You'd think Norwich is an easy game. Uh, Crystal Palace at home. Villa win, you know, four of their remaining eight games. We could actually be looking at a, 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 a relatively decent finish, mate, to be... if You know, if we're being... Optimistic, you know, four out of eight. Which we are here. Yeah, we are always, here on the Villa Philip. Always. But four, four for I mean four for eight, I don't think that's unrealistic. And you look at you look at how wishy-washy Tottenham have been. We don't know when the Liverpool game's ever going to get played. Same with Burnley at home. Um, but you know, you'd like to think that at the very least, Burnley twice, Norwich and Palace is 12 points, right? <laughs> well, right, right. Uh, <laughs> you, you never know, mate. You never know. It's it's a very interesting. You know, we would have liked to have said the same of when we had Leeds, Newcastle, Watford, and and Brighton. We would have loved to say, yes, yeah, there's twelve true. points surely. And, and you know, we went and took what was it four. Um, so it's it's very difficult to say, isn't it? It's like you know, definitely we there are plenty of winnable games left this season. I think we at Villa, we all know, are very capable of going and winning them. It's just as we know from a lifetime of support in this great club, mate. It's it's never that simple, is it? Um, but you know, then by the same token, we're capable of going performing against the best teams. So Villa have, have shown that, um, you know, like for instance, our last game against Arsenal, for as poor as we were, it wasn't a lot between the two sides. Neither no. really impressed and like you know when you consider that Leicester is, is a game we can go and perform in um, Spurs as you said I think uh, I think Liverpool you can probably write off as well as City on the last day of the season um, but there's, you're, right, you're right there's definitely an opportunity for points and I think um, if we do want to progress and, and close as I said that 10 point gap we do have that game in hand uh, it's got to start with three points at Molyneux mate absolutely and that is a good note to end this podcast on Guys, let us know your predictions in the comments below and subscribe to the channel if you're not subscribed. It would be nice, even though extremely unlikely, if we could hit 6K by the end of the season. Uh, you know, we're currently about 850 away from that. So if you guys would get subscribing, that would mean the world to us. And again, make sure you shout out Charlotte in the comments for editing the audio on this and making us sound way better than we have after before. So yeah, like, comment, subscribe and up the villa.